Welcome to the Dark Ages. As you can see, no you can't. Well that's because it's dark, for the ages. You get it. Anyway, this is my channel so... Let there be light. Ah, uh, there we go. So this is the Middle Ages, the medieval period or whatever you want to call the disease-ridden Europe that just wanted to conquer and divide and conquer again. How do the rich people eat in these times? It's simple. They open their mouths, they take the food in, chew, swallow, and tell the people let them eat cake or something. But if you're asking for the what, here it goes, saffron rice. Saffron was a thing of rich people back then, maybe even until now. I've lived decades already, and I have never seen saffron in my life. Apparently it's from this flower called Crocus sativus, and people had to pick the threads of it by hand and dry it out to have this very aromatic thing. But Europe never had this flower in the medieval times. It was a Middle Eastern thing. The Mideasties used this for medicine and cooking, which you can't do today. Just imagine the experience if you crushed laxatives and made pancakes with them. So the saffrons traveled to Europe via the Phoenicians. They traded in the Mediterranean and then poof. Saffron in Europe after the Moors got it to Spain in the 8th century? The rice part? Well, it's kind of meh. It's literally the rice we get today, but somehow rare back then when there was more planting, planting, planting. It's either basmati or long-grained rice also known as the everything-you-need-rice-for type of rice. When saffron rice was made, you had to bloom the saffron thread, submerge it in warm water to get that golden color. When the saffron becomes golden brown, add the rice into the water. Eventually, the entire thing would be yellow, and it's now ready to eat. I'm seeing it now. This video is about to become a big cooking show. The history's just a bonus. The yellow color it had made it perfect for people who want to flaunt to everyone how rich they were. That was how Marie Antoinette got guillotined, but go ahead. Kings, queens, aristocrats, basically everyone who had the means to buy this for consumption would buy it. Like Richard II of England. Peacock. P what? Peacock? Oh, I stand corrected. This is probably about to get wild in some of these things. Peacocks might be edible, but just because you can doesn't mean you should eat them. For one, they're stringy. The meat is also tough, and it probably doesn't taste good. Plus, they're definitely hardcore to raise just to eat. The preparation of a peacock starts with removing the skin and feathers, which are a lot. They're not gonna throw all those parts away just yet. After the bird finishes getting roasted, the skin and feathers would be put back on the bird. Brother in cooking, is this how taxidermy was done in the olden days? The peacock would be served with its head looking up. Yeah, this was just some random BS the old money did to show their wealth. I believe we call it fine dining nowadays. Cooking food without focusing on the food, but the theatrics or storylines behind the dish. Some sort of made-up peacock lore on why Lord Shen from Kung Fu Panda got cooked. For the most part, peacocks were hunted, but there were some that were raised just to be eaten, which is again, a huge pain in the ass. In other cases, the nobles would buy them from India just because they can. There was only so much you could buy with a lot of money in the medieval period anyway. Makes a lot of sense why Mansa Musa just threw gold like candy. This was King Henry VIII. He was rich. He had all the things he could get already, but he still had a lot of cash. Hmm. What better way to spend it than a badly flavored peacock, which costed three generations of family already? Lamprey. You probably don't know what lampreys look like. Here's one of them. What in the sweet bejesus is that? The Loch Ness Monster's tail? Rich medieval people should have just left this underwater. But nothing is scary when you have money. Probably said by a man from a noble family or something. And, would you believe it? It was the Brit royalties who love munching on exotic thingamajigs. These lampreys lived in rivers and are shaped like eels, so it's pretty much like an eel. Long, slimy, flaccid, and hard to catch. But there were a lot of them in River Severn during spring. These freaks of nature were expensive as hell during Christmas for two reasons. It was one of the meaty foods that were allowed to be eaten during the people's Christmas fast. And two, lampreys are rare in winter. Chefs would often bake these little cluster Fs into pies, like mix this and this and this and this with the lamprey, and then it's good to bake. They weren't called lamprey pies, because it sounded so disgusting, so politician's pie it was. Oh, the rich French loved lamprey too. They made dishes from it, like lamprey a la bordelaise. I wouldn't be surprised the French liked it, considering the fish looked like it was from hell. In the 19th century, the popularity of lampreys went down hard because of pollution. But pollution didn't stop Queen Elizabeth II from having it on her coronation feast. Today, Baltic and Scandinavian countries eat lampreys as delicacy, and I would like it to stay that way because not even the people who like eating it would like to eat it on a daily basis. Whales. Ha! You think medieval people would stop at those little flaccid and slimy creatures? 
No, go big or go home. Whales. These giants don't come in easily, normally because it's hard to get whales when you don't have the courage like the people in the old times did. They were whaling like hell, but to get the ones that turned to food, it was usually by luck. Places like Norway, Iceland, and British Isles have whales that get washed to the shore. These whales called for feasts. Meat, fat, bones, all of them were used for something. A hard meat like the whales. Wait, I phrased it so suspiciously. A whale's meat is so tough, cooks would cover the toughness by spreading spices around it to compensate. If they didn't do it, it would lead up to these things happening. What do we have here today? Sir, today we have something called baleine couverte de n'importe quelle merde pour compenser son mauvais goût. Sounds fancy. I'm fancy. Let me eat that. Be careful, sir. That one is just for presentation. We haven't yet finished the entire process. You could have told me that first before I devoured this. Sir, with all due respect, I guess money is all you have. No patience, no etiquette, no listening skills, nothing. Just money. So if I may, let me get this off your table so we can put the real one in. In fact, these medieval aristocrats probably couldn't give two flying ducks about the food. They just wanted to be lavish, and they wanted people to see them as lavish. It's hard to be a social climber those days. Now, you can just go to Monaco via economy class and take a bunch of photos and go back to your jobless Tuesday morning. The church considered whales as fish, so it was fine to eat them when fasting. Pheasants. Okay, hear me out on this one. Kevin from Up was a snipe, but he looks so much like a pheasant, and the richy rich ate his kind back then. This started around in Asia, and the Romans said, you know what? Screw Russell's pet, let's take it to Europe and make something out of it. Servants would hunt pheasants in woodlands and farmlands, and would you believe that it was also considered a sport? This is one of the birds that actually tasted pretty good compared to other meats like the peacocks and the whales, making it really nice to eat. For the noble, it was an option to serve it whole, or chopped depending on their mood to either talk business or eat. They didn't eat pheasants on its own. They also had to smother some imported spices like cinnamon, ginger, and saffron to make it taste and smell good. Then once it's smothered, it could be roasted or mushed to be made into a pie. If you were a noble slightly on budget, you can mix pheasants with vinegar and honey. Same with the peacock. It's a total ass pain to raise, so they let the birds thrive for a while and then kill them. Brawn. Brawn was called head cheese. Head cheese could also be a good name for a torture method where someone would drill a hole in your skull and put a rat in it or something, I don't know. But brawns were dishes usually made from a pig's head. It's the first time we're seeing something originate from Germany here, and we were not disappointed. Wild boars was the main ingredient here until the 16th century, when they switched to the pink ones. The pig's head gets cleaned first. You remove the brain, the hair, and then boil it for God knows how many hours to get the meat separated from the bones. Sprinkle seasonings in there, like Gordon Ramsay does with his dishes. Once the meat was chopped and mixed with the seasoned broth, it was poured into molds and chilled to get that jelly texture. I wouldn't expect jelly to be made out of any part of a pig, but here we are, and I am close to being appalled, but some little birdie said to not be too disgusted, or we'd be demonetized. The gelatin was naturally inside the pig's head already, and all they had to do was to cool it down for it to be nom nom nommed. Some European variations are called head cheese sulza, or Schwartenmagen. The baguettes called it fromage de tête and cooked it like the Brit version. The brawn may not be some ultra expensive food to get, but the reason why it's in here is because the rich people would eat it for the reason of flexing. How exactly flex is what you may ask. It's by showing that they could eat dishes made from an entire arsenal of animals that they wish to get it from. Cinnamon wafers. Do you remember this trend back in the 2010s? Yeah, they got that in the medieval period too, but not in powdered form. They did it cookie style. Cinnamon used to be imported from Sri Lanka, and it took the traders months or years to deliver it to Europe, so it costed a lot, mostly because of the labor fee for traveling via camels or something. The price of cinnamon was so high that it was sometimes used as the actual currency. Freaking rich people. Hello people of Westeros, I am Jamius Oliveris Gordonis Wolf Gangus, in this episode of Cooking for the Rich. So I don't get flogged, I'm gonna show you how to bake cinnamon wafers. It's a dish that you'll surely enjoy if you're immune to coughing really bad. You start with getting these ingredients. Wheat flour, sugar, egg yolks, cream, rose water, and of course, cinnamon. I know it's expensive for you people of Westeros, but if you have the balls to put 10 generations of your family in debt, you can surely make it at the comfort of your own home. Put the batter of mixture in this wafer iron and cook it over open fire. If you don't have a stove handy, you can ask your local blacksmith to lend you some fire. 
The rich people used to make cinnamon wafers with different shapes of iron casts, which of course cost a f ton. After it finishes cooking, it would look something like this. A thin and crispy waffle that looks like the sacramental bread of the church you eat during communions. Speaking of communions, cinnamon wafers were eaten as a final blessing in religious amens. If you want the not-so-commoner version of the cinnamon wafers, just add expensive bullshit in there like saffron and whale meat and the nobles would immediately say, hmm, interesting, definitely suits my palate, but it's interesting. Manchette bread. Manchette bread was the Patek Philippe of breads back then. Just a normal bread would do, but rich people want the high-quality ones just because they can. It was a bread made from wheat flour. Commoners and peasants ate a different type of bread. They had the darker and tougher ones made with barley or rye. The manchette bread was as hard to make as it was expensive. The wheat flour was thoroughly filtered with cloth to remove the bigger pieces. Did they seriously just filter it with cloth? What were they looking for? Sand? But to be fair, flour these days are really fine. So I can't blame the rich people back in the medieval times. The yeast made out of beer, barm gets dissolved in water, and mixed with the superfiltered flour. The dough gets kneaded too, like how we do it these days. After the first rise, the dough gets pressed down to release any trapped air, and then it gets shaped into loaves. After baking, it looks something like this. Jesus spotted in a loaf of manchette bread. Repent now. It becomes this soft, spongy bread with a tender crumb. Leave the hard, rough, and dense loaves to the untouchables. The cool and rich kids enjoy manchette bread. Sometimes, during feasts, these manchette breads even got used as trenchers, also known as plates a practical way so that the plates don't get thrown away as waste. After eating what's inside, rich people get to enjoy the fine bread. And if you come to think of it, when manchette bread becomes a plate, it essentially becomes a tortilla of a taco. I see you medieval people. Y'all might not see since y'all are dead, but I see what you did there. I know this voice won't do justice to how I'm about to pronounce it, so let me get a human. Hey human, pronounce taco like a British. Excuse me, what? Yeah, you heard me. All right, here it goes for the sake of the punchline. Taco. Haha, <laughs> great job. Now, continue writing the script so I can say something. The ninth Earl of Northumberland, Henry Percy, absolutely loved the manchette bread. In fact, he eats it on a daily basis, not just for banquets on all the fancy fine dining stuff. This bread was so exclusive for the rich that there was a law in the 13th century in England called the Assize of Bread. Haha, <laughs> the law basically says that the price of the bread would be set according to the price of wheat. So in times of wheat being cheap and peasants could barely afford it, the finished product would still be so expensive that only the top of the pyramid would be able to buy it. If bakers tried to cheat the system, they'd either get fined, flogged, or killed. Damn, guys. Gatekeeping at its finest. Verjuice. Or it can be spelled vertjuice because it's in French meaning green juice. It's a sour and unfermented juice squeezed from green grapes, the ones that weren't yet ripe. Yuck. In other cases, other fruits were used like crab apple or gooseberries. It's really acidic, and it was used in cooking stuff or just solely for sauce. When citrusy fruits like lemons became available in Europe, this was the bomb. Farmers would take the unripe grapes in late summer, squeezed and filtered. The juice was then mixed with a little bit of salt to make it last longer. In medieval Europe, verjuice was an essential ingredient in many kitchens, especially for the wealthy. It was often used to deglaze pans, creating rich sauces that were drizzled over meats like chicken, pork, and lamb. One common dish was roast pork with verjuice sauce, which balanced the richness of the meat with the sour bite of the juice. Verjuice was also used in soups, such as a chicken soup with verjuice and herbs, and in vinaigrettes for salads. In some regions, it was a key ingredient in pickling vegetables, and it even found its way into medieval pastries, adding a tart flavor to sweet tarts and fruit pies. In Dijon, France, verjuice was famously used in mustard recipes, contributing to the sharp, tangy flavor that the region's mustards are still known for today. Beaver tail. It may sound crazy, but they could have also gotten a platypus tail since those two were somehow the same. But beaver tail became a luxury food because of how people interpreted fasting rules. The church clergy believed the beaver was a fish due to the fact that beavers have a water-focused lifestyle and scaly tail. So even if the beaver is a mammal, the tail wasn't. Peasants live nowhere near wetlands, so the rich of course can take advantage of this if fish supply is low. All they had to do was set up traps and the beaver would do the work for them. Devouring this in Europe was common only during fasting times because there would be no sense to catch them if the nobles could just eat pork or beef or whatever. They prepare it by slow cooking the tail in a broth like many fish dishes, or they could roast it and then remove the scales before eating. Weird stuff if you ask me. 
Berry Stuffed Pigeons We're back to somehow the normal stuff, although this is still borderline medieval-ish. There were a lot of pigeons in Europe for different reasons. Messengers, racing, medicine, and surprise. Food. There were a lot of dovecoats inside the properties of these noble people. Dovecoats were pigeons raised for food. Unlike the peacock, pigeons are somehow easier to raise because they're not that fancy. Now the young ones in these dovecoats were called squabs, and they were the more expensive ones because their meat were noise. Chef's kiss tender, making berry stuffed pigeons was the same with the other ones in this list. Daunting. Clean the pigeons and then marinate it in wine to give the birds a little more oomph in the flavor. Then, the main event of the dish was putting blackberries and juniper inside, or maybe add some herbs like sage, rosemary, and thyme for the aroma and extra digestion magic. This process is somehow like how we do Thanksgiving turkeys, minus the berries. I don't know what's with medieval nobles and putting feathers back to birds after cooking them. Stop giving animals taxidermy if you're just gonna eat them. Or maybe not because the dishes on the table of nobles were for glitz and glam mostly. Italy had something like this around Tuscany and Umbria. It's called Piccione Arosto, but with cheese instead of berries. Hedgehog meatballs. Now before you say anything, calm your butts. They didn't eat actual hedgehogs. I think it's because of the same reason you don't eat sea urchins with the shell. It's spiky. It's actually made out of ground pork or veal that's wrapped in pork call or that membrane in the pig's stomach, plus some spices. To make this hedgehog monstrosity for these pretentious food connoisseurs, the spiced meat mixture would be shaped into circles, then cut blanched almonds would be cut to sticks to be the spines. Finally, they roast it in the oven and glaze it after. I have zero idea about what they thought of when making this dish, but apparently, it was a part of the trend back then called subtleties, where dishes would be made to look like animals to impress the guests. So that's why they cook birds and make it look like they taxidermied it with a whole lot of other stuff after cooking. I see, I see. They were sometimes served as an appetizer, or something that people would be entertained. Go to a Michelin star restaurant, you'll probably see these types of subtleties. Egg custard with nutmeg. Ooh, we're back to the normal stuff. Egg custard with nutmeg was expensive because of the nutmeg. These were imported from Banda Islands in Indonesia, so you know it was for the rich. I mean, you could make this for 8 or $10 today, or whatever, but this was hundreds of years ago. The eggs would be whisked with cream or milk, and then a razzle-dazzle of sugar. The nutmeg came last as they grated over the mixture before putting it in the oven. Ding dong bakers. It looked like creme brulee. This recipe is right in this cookbook. The form of curry. This medieval thing was made by King Richard II's chefs. What's amazing is, it took me this long to say that most of the foods on this list, if not all, are in the form of curry. I think I should have said those things earlier. But anyway, egg custards were not only in England, but in places like France, where it was called flan pâtissier, and in Italy, where the recipes kind of differ a bit. It was baked with rose water, cinnamon for extra steps of making a nice dessert, for the oligarchs, peasants ate gruels while the elite ate cake. Nutmegs were even guarded by Portuguese and Dutch businessmen, who monopolized the industry, so only the richest could ever afford having these types of food. I guess many of these foods are now accessible to an ordinary person. You probably just have to have a tough stomach, because no way on earth would you tank a peacock on its own without gagging. 